All right, thank you, Mike, or Mark, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so hello, everyone. My name's Clinton Hilliard. Uh, I'm the programs director for NCOSI Chesapeake chapter here, and I'll be uh, administering tonight's Zoom event with my co-host Paul Martin in the booth up there. Um, first of all, we'd like to welcome you to this monthly lecture series this June of 2020. Uh, I'd like to start by also thanking the John Hopkins APL for its generous support for helping us to produce tonight's speaking event. Uh, they're providing both facilities and the audio video video staff to support this. Thank you, Bill and Mitch. Um, so tonight, our speaker is Mr. Mike Pafford. Mike is a prior president of our Chesapeake chapter and has been an NCOSI member for over 22 years. Mike is a former US Air Force uh, multi-language analyst, a US Navy cryptographic officer, and intelligence systems lead engineer. He retired from um, the John Hopkins APL in 2016 as a C4 ISR project manager. And up until December of 2018, he was instructor, or he instructed uh, software systems engineering at the John uh, Hopkins University Whitting School of Engineering. Uh, Mike is a member of the NCOSI Object Oriented Systems Engineering Method and Systems Software Interface Working Groups. Since 2015, Mike has also facilitated multiple educational workshops on the lean startup methods and agile initial project planning. So tonight, Mike, we welcome you, and uh, Mike is gonna be providing an update on a project that he is a, a part of. It's called the Resilient Hospital Systems Engineering um, Team. And this team has been working their model-based systems engineering project since 2018, and I believe, in fact, the project won an NCOSI award for collaboration. So Mike, I'm gonna let you take the floor now. Great, thanks Clinton. <clears throat> Good evening everyone. Uh, uh, thanks for letting me talk with you all tonight about uh, an ongoing resilient hospital reference model MBSE project. Now you'll see several QR codes uh, tonight in this briefing. Feel free to use any QR code reader app you might have to scan and immediately retrieve any information these uh, codes point to. For example, the QR code you see here points to a Dropbox location where you can download a PDF of these slides, including a version with notes pages. No Dropbox account is needed to download the files. And I'll show this QR, I'll show this QR code again at the end of the briefing in case anyone wants to download a QR code reader in the meantime. And I'll take a, uh, I'll just leave this uh, on this slide for a few more seconds in case anybody wants to try to capture that QR code. Here's a, here's a uh, look at the book being raffled off this evening. Uh, everyone will want to stick around for that. Uh, the team it hasn't had a chance to really get into this book yet, but we think it's going to turn out to be a good reference for our work. We especially like the fact that it's a systems engineering-like book, systems thinking, written by representatives of our project key stakeholders in the healthcare community. Now the QR code here will point you to more information about that book. This slide shows icons for the volunteer, this is a volunteer uh, project, Resilient Hospital Systems Engineering Team. Uh, members, uh, that's mainly NCOSI, IEEE, and FBI InfraGuard, as well as a couple of our healthcare st key stakeholders from the National Association of County and City Healthcare Officers, or health officials, NACHO, and the Society for Disaster Medicine and Public Health, or SDMPH. This slide is uh, more information about some of those team members and key stakeholders in case some of you may not be familiar with them. Uh, for example, you'll see the, uh, the URL and a QR code for FBI InfraGuard. You'll see another one for the National Association of County and City Health Officials, or NACHO. And you'll see one for the Society for Disaster Medicine and Public Health, SDMPH. Read each one of these across. I just didn't want to put the QR codes too close to each other. Here's some background information about our uh, project. One thing I guess is, is good about Zoom is that it's hard to have a, a real eye chart anymore because uh, they're uh, using Zoom. You should be able to, even if I 
like I did here, put too many words on the slides, uh, you all should be able to zoom in on it and read it okay. The Resilient Hospital Reference Model, Model-Based Systems Engineering Project, was motivated by work detailed in the booklet Resilient Hospital Handbook, authored by NCOSI member Charles Manto, whom a lot of you might know, as well as doctors Earl Motzer and James Turbush. James, uh, uh, Jim Turbush is one of our uh, uh, team participants as well as a key stakeholder. Following the publication of this pamphlet, in a series of subsequent discussions, it was decided that follow-up systems engineering might work and, and might provide added value based on the use of current and modern model-based contributions from several NCOSI working groups that we've interfaced with already, the IEEE uh, team members that we have, and FBI InfraGuard team members that we have, in collaboration with key stakeholders from SDMPH and NACHO, like uh, Dr. Terbush and other healthcare organizations. Now the project has been in, underway since 2018, building on 2017 initial efforts of a microgrid reference model project. As work continues on that microgrid reference model project, the work of the, of the Resilient Hospital Reference Model MBSE project is, has garnered significant interest from several healthcare-related organizations. Here's some more information about that pamphlet. It's a small book, uh, the Resilient Hospitals Handbook that we've uh, been referring to all along. Now, of course, you can get the pamphlet on Amazon. But you can also get a free PDF version at the FBI InfraGuard URL shown here. The QR code will also take you directly to that FBI InfraGuard site to get that free uh, PDF version. This slide outlines the, the project's purpose, goal, and vision. The purpose is to develop a generic, right now, develop a generic resilient hospital reference model to enhance current planning for preparedness, protection, prevention, response, mitigation, and recovery, initially as they all pertain to hospital prolonged power outages. One of the goals is to provide all hospitals with a resilient hospital decision support capability, leveraging model-based systems engineering techniques and tools that any hospital can use to enhance planning before, during, and after a prolonged power outage. And the vision that we have is that, the resilient, this, that this resilient hospital decision support capability can be replicated and scaled to offer the same kinds of model-based tools and resources for other critical infrastructure at the public health care, local, tribal, state, regional, and national levels. When we briefed the Resilient Hospital Reference Model, MBSE project, to our healthcare key stakeholders, this is the slide we use to explain what we mean by Resilient Hospital Reference Model. Resilient hospital reference models, they enable hospitals in general to collaboratively model, that is, describe and diagram in a common repository, and share reference data and information about hospital critical operations in the beginning as they pertain to prolonged power outages, establish a common reference framework, and effectively and efficiently coordinate the provision of resources and services. These models will enable planning and decision-making in compliance with all local, tribal, state, regional, and national requirements and standards. That's what we call references. They're meant to be flexible and scalable to enable hospitals to successfully integrate their operational references into broader healthcare coalition catastrophic event planning, execution, and evaluation frameworks, as well as National Emergency Healthcare Response Systems. Here's a general roadmap for the uh, project that we've been using to brief our healthcare key stakeholders about where the project is headed. Again, uh, it looks a little bit of an eye chart now, but you should be able to manipulate it like you want from your, from your Zoom uh, screens. Some of you might recognize this as the roadmap originally used by the NCOSI MBSE initiative. As always, the x-axis is roughly a project timeline, and the y-axis shows increasing project outcome 
Out comes maturity from concept through knowledge and experience, through well-defined uh, capability and a capability for any hospital. The banner across the top includes, <clears throat> uh, uh, includes high-level capabilities developed during initial project planning, or IPP, that will be refined over the course of the project. The lower right bullets you, you see there in blue are representative high-level project team processes that we uh, relay onto the key stakeholders that the team has been trying to, uh, uh, to accomplish. And like any roadmap, this one will be updated based on changes in stakeholder expectations that we know is going to change our current or planned work. Here's a very informal, high-level flow diagram of how we are moving along the project roadmap. We've already made good headway with the top three items, that red dashed area you see there, during our initial project planning, or IPP, and we're now into our initial project execution, or IPE. So in our initial project planning, as you see in the upper left there, we had three workshops where we invited decision makers, decision maker level, uh, from the, uh, decision makers from engineering and healthcare coalitions to give us abstract, plain language, problems, issues, needs, scenarios, et cetera. And we captured, and, uh, we captured, that, uh, uh, that we captured that information. As I may have mentioned before, that, that information, uh, as I'll tell you here in a little bit, how, how Encozy members can go on to Encozy Connect and gather all of that information that we use during those three initial project planning uh, meetup workshops. And at that workshop, we employed a hybrid, we employed a hybrid uh, approach that uses best practices from the lean startup method and agile. Agile, Agile Systems Engineering, Software Engineering, and Agile Project Management, and the outcome of those three workshops were project focus mechanisms, project vision, goals, scope, stakeholders, uh, stakeholder groups, capabilities, and that type of thing. This slide is, you all may recognize this, is a lucid chart slide. It's a lucid chart flow diagram that shows the process steps we used in our initial project planning steps shown on the previous slide in that red dotted area. For our IPP work, we used a hybrid approach based on best practices from, as I mentioned, from the Lean Startup Method, LSM, and Agile. That's Agile Systems Engineering, Agile Software Engineering, and Agile Project Management. As you can see here, uh, what we've done is we've de we determined who, who the project workshop attendees should be. We got, we got them, uh, and so we, 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 we had a good at attendees and, and invitees list to the workshops. Then we conducted the three uh, IPP workshops and we developed, started to develop our seven project focus mechanisms. Uh, a project focus mechanism, uh, 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 number one being the project, le project decision level perspectives that we would need uh, throughout the rest of the, the meetups. And then we developed a project focus mechanism two, the project title and purpose statements. The, and we got, and what, again, we, what we got from that is a project title and purpose statements. And then with the, key, with the uh, attendees, the decision level uh, uh, folks, we developed project focus mechanism number three, which is based on agile project management or the business model canvas that you all may be uh, familiar with. And, and, I, and I, uh, I guess I would like to back up just a little bit on, on project focus mechanism number two. We used a systems thinking roundtable guide that some of you might be familiar with from the Encozy Systems Science Working Group. Dr. Sue Gabriel uh, developed this guide, and, I, and we used that guide uh, in the de development with these key stakeholders and decision makers on developing a consensus project title and purpose statements. So that was a, a, a current and modern systems engineering practice. And, that, and what we got from that is we got the titles and purpose statements that were consensus and that they could focus on for the rest of the project, that we could focus on for the rest of the project. And then we did use agile project management and, and, and uh, tailored the business model camp, uh, canvas 
to, to come up with the Project Vision Board Extended. And then we developed the pro, uh, pro, uh, Project Focus Mechanism Number Four, which were the which the Agile folks call personas, but means stakeholder groups, named stakeholder groups. And then we developed Project Focus Mechanism Number Five, which is the, the project stakeholder groups and and uh, and uh, the binning of the of the the many project stakeholders. We got into into a larger grouping, and and then after that. In this series of three workshops, all-day workshops, we developed project focus mechanism number six, which is a combined higher-level stakeholder groups. And lastly, we at the at the at the meetup workshops, we developed project focus mechanism number seven with our key stakeholders, the the, the preliminary project capabilities list. And then we mean to we leverage those and we refer to those throughout the rest of the rest of the project. That is the that is the, the value of this particular initial project planning approach that we used. And here's just a, uh, and I've been offering these, I've been offering these free initial project planning, Lean Startup Method and Agile for initial project planning workshops now since December of 2015. I've offered it several times. Anybody wanting to know more about those workshops can uh, go ahead and get a hold of me at any time. This slide is a Venn diagram that just shows how this hybrid Lean Startup Method Agile uh, initial project planning approach was meant to be used, was meant to use best practices from LSM and Agile. And this uh, LSM Agile IPP approach will work no matter the type of project execution used during the project life cycle, whether it be plan driven, waterfall, Agile, Lean, or whatever. This hybrid approach would still set you up with a very strong set of project focus mechanisms. Here's some information about the uh, free Lucid chart tools, tool that we use. Of course, there's a fee-based version also. And the QR code will take you to the URL you see there. Now, besides the free Lucid chart tool to date, the team has used the Microsoft Office tools that we're sure most, if not all, of our key stakeholders already have and already use. As a volunteer team hoping to add new value into the healthcare domain, we've so far been trying to maximize the use of free or existing tools and techniques. And here also, as I mentioned before, here also is where in Encozy Connect that Encozy members can get all of the materials that the team is using, uh, that the team used to conduct the three uh, project IPP workshops at JHUAPL between April and October of 2018. So feel free to go in and to take a look at the, uh, and what you'll see in there is you'll see what, uh, what's called the meetup artifacts, where we just tried to capture everything on whiteboard, take a picture of it, flip charts, take a picture of it, however we could get the information from the key stakeholders, and uh, then we take that information behind in, into our own offices, and we'll do, we, we'll do the cleanup and the post-up and work on the project itself. But you're free to, to take a look at all of that uh, initial project planning information. Now, going back to that high-level flow diagram of how the team is moving along the project roadmap, this slide shows the general steps that the team has taken in its initial project planning. That's the red da uh, dotted uh, part you see there as well as the general steps that we are currently emphasizing in our initial project execution, or IPE. That's a purple dashed area that you see there. And once again, you'll see that we've, we've, uh, we've captured, we've, in, in our meetup, three meetup, uh, uh, three meetup workshop, we followed this, we followed this uh, Lean Startup and Agile uh, method and we, we captured a consensus project, project vision, stakeholder group, product. We, we captured a lot of stuff in there in a, in a meetup type of uh, environment. And now we're actually, we're actually doing a bit more work in, in this green area right here to actually come up with scenarios, use cases, and epic user stories. And once we've captured those, we're going to use that combined output in, to move into model-based concept definition with our key stakeholders. Uh, and uh, I'll mention that a little bit more here in a second. This slide is another Lucid chart we've built to detail some of those process steps I just told you about, which we're using in our initial project execution. 
our, our initial IPP work resulted in a strong set of project, seven project focus mechanisms, including number seven, a preliminary capabilities list that I've, I've highlighted here. And the, and the Agile, in the Agile community, you, you may know that they refer to those as aspects. <clears throat> that in other squared process blocks and ribbon output icons that you see here, uh, represent the other process steps and artifacts in our current IPE work. For example, we'll take the information from our meetups, and, and, and after we've cleaned them up, of course, we'll use that information and we'll build, along with our stakeholders, we'll build some system level scenarios, which, are, which the Agile folks also call activities. And then we'll use that information that builds on itself to develop a set of system level use cases. And, and what's really nice is that uh, we, everybody uses the same term there, system level use cases. And then we'll use all of the previous information to come up with a set of epic user stories. The Agile folks uh, uh, call those epic user stories. <clears throat> so this slide is an excerpt from the ever-growing Project Microsoft Excel workbook. This is what we refer to as a cleanup part of the meetup, cleanup, and post up of the initial project planning and initial project execution. The left column here is an excerpt from one part of IPP, the project focus mechanism number seven, preliminary system level capabilities list, also referred to as aspects. The right column is one of the handoffs from IPP to IPE. And that is the transformation of capabilities or aspects into gerund statements or ING statements, which the team is now using in close collaboration with our healthcare key stakeholders to develop system scenarios, which the Agile folks call activities, system use cases, and system level epic user stories. And then we're also going to be using those gerund statements as processes in our model based concept definition using the object process methodology specification as a guide. As I mentioned, other ongoing project team initial project execution work involves developing a model-based concept definition of the reference model. The team is currently using the free OpCat and OpCloud model-based concept definition tools designed by Encozy member Dove Dory and his team using the specification he championed ISO PAS 19450, uh, uh, colon 2015, entitled Automation Systems and Integration Object Process Methodology, or OPM. The, o the OpCat and OpCloud tools enable the team to produce and readily review with our key stakeholders uh, resilient hospital reference model concepts at varying levels of details and viewpoints. The varying levels of details and the viewpoints has really caught the attention of our key stakeholders. As far as modeling is concerned, they really latched onto that uh, right away. And how, the, how when one thing changes in a common, in a model description and diagrams in a common database, when one, one aspect of it or an element, aspect of an element, attribute of an element changes at any level, you can immediately see what, uh, what else is affected. And they really like that because they're living right now with flat files or paper-based three-ring binders. And you can imagine that uh, how many times they've missed something that happens in a flat file or in a three-ring binder. They miss what, what, a, what everything else that it affects. And of course, there's no viewpoints. So they really like this idea. So we've got them hooked as far as they push the I believe button on modeling. We'll, we'll see where we can take them. So this slide shows just one example of how the team is leveraging IPP outcomes in OpCat and OpCloud to produce these detailed resilient hospital reference model concept models, which we continually review with our key stakeholders. This slide lists some of the project-related events that team members have attended or plan to attend. We, like, I, like I've been mentioning, we had three LSM Agile uh, resilient hospital reference model, model-based systems engineering, initial project planning IPP workshops at, here at JHUAPL and from April to October of 2018. And those were attended by key stakeholders as well as INCOSI, IEEE, FBI, InfraGuard, and some team members that were also members of SDMPH and NACHO. And in 2018 and 2019, uh, 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 we gave this project update and tutorials uh, to the INCOSI Chesapeake chapter 
I gave a talk that here in February of 2018. The same talk I was able to give at the NASA Goddard in March of 2018. Both of those are online at YouTube, and, uh, and NASA's equivalent of YouTube. You can just uh, uh, search for those. The Great Lakes Regional Conference of 2018 and the Energy Tech of 2018. And uh, we also gave updates and tutorials on, that, that use this project as examples. And the Healthcare Working Group Systems Engineering Conference uh, in May of, to, of, of 2019. And the Energy Tech uh, uh, 2019 Great Lakes Research uh, uh, Regional Conference 2019 in Cleveland. We were also uh, able to give a, a, a tutorial and an update there. And we did present a paper at, S, at the SDMPH meeting in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. And one of our project team members, actually the project team lead, Howard Likens, did represent the team at the SDMPH national meeting in August of last year. Now, just before we started all the lockdown here, as you all know, a couple of us, Dr. Terbush and myself, we were able to brief our, the status at the Colorado South Central Healthcare Coalition at uh, St. Francis Medical Center in Colorado Springs in January 2020, which was a wonderful uh, opportunity for systems engineers to talk to and network with key stakeholders. And then I uh, had a chance to drive on out to uh, 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 Torrance and, and uh, give a couple of, the, of sessions out there at IW20. Uh, we've also given a project status briefing to the INCOSI Requirements Working Group in April. And of course, I'm talk, speaking with you all now uh, here in June. And, uh, and, we're, and a couple of the members will be attending two upcoming virtual NATO conferences in July and August. The July one in Denver was made a virtual and the August one in Dallas was also made virtual. Now we proposed a briefing and tutorial at the next GLRC in Detroit in September and we're already on the schedule for the Healthcare Working Group uh, System Engineering Conference in Minneapolis in October. We'll have to see if those go uh, live or virtual. But that just gives you an idea of, how, of some of the ways that we've been trying to continue a, a tight interface with our key stakeholders. This slide shows icons for healthcare domain references the team has been collecting and using during IPP and IPE. One of the things we, we're, we're, uh, we're gonna be providing them, and we're, using, we're, we're, we're trying to stick to this idea of iterative development for incremental delivery of value. You all know that as, the, as how the Agile folks work. And one of, the iterative, one of the incremental deliveries of value that we hope to give them is a PDF version of a digital library, which we've, we've uh, collected and continue to update uh, through literally through Google News Alerts, through Google News Alerts of anything that has to do with hospital power outages. When we catch something like that in Google News, we download that, make it into a PDF file, and put it into this digital library. And so now we hope to be able to offer our key stakeholders this digital library on that, that will keep them current, that will help keep them current as far as the news on uh, hospital power outages is concerned. But one of the goals of the project is to help our healthcare key stakeholders transition from these flat file references you see here uh, into a model-based collaborative reference framework. And these are, of course, just some examples of the many references used by our healthcare uh, key stakeholders, you can imagine. Here is contact information for some of the re, uh, Resilient Hospital Reference Model MBSE project team members. This volunteer project is always looking for new team members and or key stakeholders. So please get a hold of the team lead, Howard Likens, if you'd like to know more about the project or if you'd like to join the project as a team member or key stakeholder from the healthcare community. Now, John Juhas or I uh, can also answer any, any general questions about project background, history, and ongoing or planned work. So here again is that QR code that I told you about that you can use to get these slides immediately from Dropbox. You'll get a PDF version of the slides and you'll get another PDF version of the slides with note pages. And I also put a flyer in there for the, uh, for the uh, Lean Startup Method Agile for IPP uh, workshops. So a little bit more information about that. Remember, no Dropbox account is needed. If it asks you to sign up and you don't want to sign up the Dropbox, just click on the prompt to continue to the site and you can download the, uh, the files, no problem. Don't forget to stick around for the, don't forget to stick around for the book raffle. 
And uh, thanks a lot. And uh, now I'll be happy to answer any questions in the time we've got left. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. All right. Um, if you could uh, type your um, uh, questions into the chat window. Um, can our video people display the chat window up here? Or maybe Paul, have Paul enable the unmute that person who's asking a question, if anyone has any questions. Okay, um, we got a question from Dave Fadley here, Mike. Uh, what is the definition of prolonged power outage? Ah, uh, that's, a, that's a good question, and we had the opportunity, and I mentioned, I, I mentioned that on 16 January, we had an opportunity to, to, to really network with a good group of key stakeholders and possible users of this reference model in Colorado Springs, Colorado. During that meeting, Somebody stood up and said, does anybody know what the definition of prolonged power outage is? And somebody said, well, I think I just got an HHS directive that has put prolonged power outage as 72 hours or more. 72 hours or more is, as of 16 January of this year, in that group, we just happened to luck into uh, them talking back and forth to each other and that's the HHS guideline that that person uh, quoted. All right, thank you. Any uh, further questions? Just type them in now if you have any other further questions. If not, we're going to um, raffle off the book now. Oh wait, hold on, here's one more coming in. We'll, get, we'll answer a question from Dave Alveridge. Dave says, did you consider other infrastructure events besides power failure? Yes, we, we, we considered that from the very beginning and uh, we're familiar with the 17, I think we're up to 17 or more now that the, that the government now calls critical infrastructure components. And again, in our work with key stakeholders, they've also asked us, have you considered other uh, key uh, uh, key infrastructures that we, we may have a lot of trouble with uh, in, in an emergency. And the number one, that one that's come up so far, is water. They, they say that we, we definitely want to work with you on coming up with a reference model for extended power outage, but we hope that when you go to flex and scale your work that you'll consider next the, uh, 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 the uh, water outages. And so, yes, we are familiar with that, and we're hoping to get, we're hoping to add value with the generic reference model, and we hope it flexes and scales, and we've already got good uh, input as far as what we should work on next. One other question, Mike. Um, Dave uh, Fadley again says, how many use cases or scenarios did you create? Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> how many use cases or scenarios did you create to describe the problem to solve? Yes, okay, we're, we're actually doing that now, Dave, and thanks for the question, but that, that's, that's part of what we consider to be the in, initial project execution. The next, the, literally the next process steps that we're taking in IPE are uh, CONOPS-like scenarios working with our key stakeholders, system level, system level uh, CONOPS scenarios, system level use cases, and system level uh, uh, epic user stories in case uh, we find that we are become, you know, we have more and more software, we have more and more software people that, that want to be participants or key stakeholders. So we're, we're, we're being pretty uh, uh, aware, we're trying to stay aware of, the, of, the, of this agile aspect as, as we go through. But literally right now we're working on, uh, we're working on the scenarios, the use cases, and the uh, epic user stories. So the answer is, I don't know, but we will find out, as we used to say in the Navy. All right, now the questions are pouring in, Mike. <laughs> uh, Steve, Steve asks, how has the pandemic affected your thinking on resiliency? Uh, well, uh, two ways. We're, 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 like everybody else, we're down to on, mostly online interfaces with our key stakeholders. That's just the way it goes. We, you know, I drove from Maryland to Colorado Springs to Torrance, California, and back again to make face-to-face, -to, -face, to make face-to-face, -to, -face, uh, uh, to do face-to-face -face networking was happy to do it. Of course, that's gone away now, so we're, we're down to uh, 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 Zoom-based uh, interfaces for the, for the most part. That's one thing. But the other thing is, is that we, as we are collecting power outage news, 
We are also collecting hospitals, uh, 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 hospitals, uh, and the, uh, how are they handling the COVID-19 pandemic? Because we're finding out day each day, we're finding out that some or many of the lessons learned for 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 uh, COVID-19 are going to be almost directly analogous to something that, something like an extended power outage. So, uh, we for example, we use the we use the book Five Days at Memorial, that written by Dr. Sherry Fink, a wonderful book about uh, a memorial hospital in in in, in, uh, in New Orleans during hotel, uh, during Hurricane Katrina, and that's been a wonderful reference for us. But we're also finding out, and and literally, Dr. Fink has also spent some time now in the Brooklyn uh, uh, hospital as far as COVID-19 is concerned. And I just sat in on a Zoom with her from the Naval Postgraduate School. And sure enough, we're getting a lot of analogous, a lot of analogous lessons learned. So the, the, the pandemic has affected us in taking away our face to face, but it's, it, it still is giving us fairly analogous uh, lessons learned. Okay, and then um, from uh, Terrace, Terrace says, um, have you worked through FCD1 and FCD2 from the FEMA, FCD being federal, or federal continuity directive? Do you know what? No, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with those. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm afraid I'm not familiar with those. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I guess I should say that we've been really good about collecting uh, DHS, HHS, CMS, CDC, uh, joint commission references and so on, and that's sort of not one I've come across yet. So, but if I, but 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 if we do, we'll 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 be sure to pay close attention to it. Okay, let's uh, let's wrap up here. I'm going to wrap up with a comment from Lee Jensen. She has there. I'm just going to read it. She says, uh, "We are here tonight on Zoom in response to the pandemic. Uh, it has also drastically altered healthcare, as an emphasis has turned." to online appointments. Thus, related to power ability to maintain connectivity will become increasingly important. Water makes sense, but so does connectivity moving forward. Yes, no doubt about it. Uh, okay, all. So um, I'm going to, uh, first, before we get started um, with the raffle, or end with the raffle, I'm going to um, make one final announcement. Is like, I hope everybody can um, attend next next month's meeting in July. We're hosting Dr. Tina Srivastava, who will be talking on an interesting topic, innovating in a secret world, which is along the lines of how, how do we do technology innovation in a national security context. And then I want to um, thank our speaker. I want to um, give him the certificate. Can you hold that mic? And then we're going to give you uh, this... Uh, Fantastic and cozy trophy here. It's called the System in a Cup. <laughs> Jeez. All right. All right. Now, what everybody's been sticking around for, I'm going to announce the winner of the raffle. I put the names of all folks that uh, had been attending tonight's um, presentation in a, a random generator, and um, I extracted the board of directors' names. Um, and it's only the people who actually attended, uh, as opposed to some people who registered but um, didn't attend. But I'm going to use uh, the uh, email from the registration to follow up with the winner. So the winner is Steve Sutton. Steve Sutton, you've won tonight's book. All right. And like I said, I'll reach out to you via your registration email to get that to you. Um, so everyone, thank you for attending. And we'll see you next month, hopefully.